Amy Klobuchar drops out of the race. Chris Matthews drops out of MSNBC. And Joe Biden has a super Monday. We will examine how the Dems are pulling out all the stops to stop Bernie before Super Tuesday. Then MSNBC pushes out Chris Matthews after 20 years. We will take a look at the bogus Me Too reasoning and then go deeper to what's really behind the ouster. All that and so much more. I'm Michael Knowles and this is The Michael Knowles Show. We simply do not have enough time to get to everything that changed yesterday in the left-wing world, but we will do our best. And first, we got to thank our friends over at Quip. You know how important it is to have nice, clean, bright, white teeth, okay? I'm not exactly an Adonis of a man. I'm not uh, like an Olympian or Hercules or something, but, you know, I've always had pretty nice teeth, and it's always helped me out with the ladies. Well, Quip makes brushing your teeth twice a day for two minutes and flossing, simple. Starts with an electric toothbrush, refillable floss, and anti-cavity toothpaste. Quip's electric brush has sensitive sonic vibrations with a built-in timer and 30-second pulses to guide a full and even clean. The Quip floss dispenser comes with pre-marked strings. You know how to use just exactly enough. Me, I'm always a little bad about it, so it really, really helps. If you go to getquip, dot com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, right now, you will get your first refill for free. You need an electric toothbrush, guys. Get into the 21st century. You need it. Go get Quip. You will get your first refill free at getquip.com slash Michael, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Michael, Quip, the good habits company. Amy Klobuchar drops out yesterday, endorses Joe Biden. Pete Buttigieg drops out two days ago, endorses Joe Biden. Beto O'Rourke drops out what seems like centuries ago, endorses Joe Biden. Nobody really cares, but he's going to do it anyway. Susan Rice didn't run for president, didn't drop out, did lie to Americans about Benghazi, but she also endorsed Joe Biden yesterday. Former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, forget about him, I'd forgotten about him too. Now, unfortunately, I got to remember him because he endorsed Joe Biden. Sleepy Joe sweeping up all of these big big endorsements. We will get to what it means first. Let's turn to Mayor Pete, who went out, campaigned with Biden himself, and endorsed the former vice president. Politics at its best is more than policy. It's soulcraft. And so it's fitting that I am joining to support a campaign that speaks so often about the soul of this nation. I don't believe the world is divided up into people who are all good and people who are all bad. I don't believe that how you voted in the past makes you good or bad. I believe that each of us can have good things and bad things brought out of us. And that's why leadership is so important. I'm looking for a leader. I'm looking for a president who will draw out what is best in each of us. And I'm encouraging everybody who is part of my campaign to join me because we have found that leader in vice president, soon to be president, Joe Biden. Mayor Pete's endorsement is just like his campaign, contrived cliche and secretly radical, right? It's, it's kind of an empty endorsement. We need politics to unify us, to bring us together. We, it's, we're not all bad people or all good people. We're, we're people and we need politics and politicians do politics. And we found a politician who does politics in Joe Biden forward together, unity, unity forward, Biden. Okay. So you just say, all right, whatever. You're just Pete Buttigieg just likes the way that his voice sounds. So that's probably the best thing he's got going for him as a candidate is his voice has a sort of nice tone to it. Uh, he uses a bunch of cliches. And then there's, there's that little secret radicalism, right? The way he opens up is he says, politics is soul craft and, and unity and Joe Biden and togetherness and moving forward and together. You say, hold on, wait, go, what did you just say? Go back to that first one about the unity. No, no, no. Before that, about the, about the togetherness. No, after that. Oh, the soul craft. Now, this is something that I think the left really believes. I think most left-wingers believe it. Pete Buttigieg just gives you a little glimpse into it. They believe that the purpose of politics is not to just sort of get along together in civil society or to defend a tradition that we've all inherited or to protect the rights that are given to us in our constitution, in our laws that are protected by our institutions. No, it's soul craft takes on this religious aspect because for the left, the state has 
all the power, all the, is due all of the reverence of a religious institution. And they believe that human nature is infinitely malleable. So, you know, conservatives tend to believe that that human nature is nature, right? You're born with it. It's set. It's broken. It's never going to be perfected. We're never going back to the Garden of Eden. The left doesn't think that. They think with just a little bit more time or a little bit more money, they will be able to perfect human nature. We'll end up in utopia. That's that the Marxist program was to perfect human nature. Uh, it's every leftist utopian program. And, and that's what Pete Buttigieg believes as well, which is unsurprising. You know, he's, he talks like a moderate, he walks like a moderate, he endorses like a moderate, but every so often you get a glimpse of that radicalism, which really is the generational shift. They talk in this, uh, in, in this endorsement about how the, the real difference between Joe and Buttigieg is generational. Well, I guess that's true, but the sad thing is if Pete Buttigieg is the moderate of his generation, it shows you just how much further to the left the millennials have gone. So Joe Biden is very excited to get this, uh, this endorsement. So he comes up there and as always just flatters and flatters and flatters. You've, you've supported a man of enormous integrity, a fellow who uh, has as much uh, moral courage as he has physical courage. And I really mean that. Like Bo, he, uh, he had a backbone like he has a backbone like a ramrod. He, I really mean this. And think about it. If Pete had been around another six years, I wouldn't be standing here. Pete would be standing. I'd be endorsing Pete. Uh, no, I really mean it. I really mean it. Yes. Yeah, so when you have to set off a certain statement that you're saying by saying, no, no, I really mean that. What you are implying is that for other things that you say, you don't really mean them. It's like when people say, hey, look, I'm going to be honest. You say, well, what were you before? Were you were lying to me before, but now you're going to be honest? Okay. If you have to set off the true statements by saying, no, no, I really mean that, then I have no reason to believe that you really believe the thing you say you mean right now. Because it means that you don't mean many of your statements, so it's very possible that you don't mean the statement, no, no, I really mean that. But this is Joe Biden's problem. It's not that Joe Biden is, I don't think he's a nefarious, you know, pre-planned, a sociopath liar. I think he has no regard for the truth. I think he doesn't care about the truth at all. And so he just flatters and ingratiates and glad hands and compliments. That's every photo of him. You know, the, all the photos of him with women, I, people tried to make it out that they were really lascivious. I don't think he's lascivious or lustful or something like that. I think he's just a flattering, oily politician who's always trying to form an intimate connection with people. And as a result of that, if you pay attention for two seconds, you realize you can't believe a word that the guy says. Nevertheless, Biden is now the clear front runner and he's already screwing this up. We will get to that in a second. First, I got to thank our friends over at Rock Auto. I don't know a whole lot about cars. Okay. When my car has broken down, I don't, I I don't have a ton of wherewithal to go and fix my car. I go to the brick and mortar shop, right? You know what? They, they never have the car part in. What they do is they just go online. They probably go to rockauto.com and then they order the part and then they charge me a lot more money. Chain stores have different price tiers for their professional mechanics and do it yourselfers. And it's, it's just a, a constant mess rockauto.com always offers the lowest prices possible rather than changing the prices based on what the market will bear like airlines do. Why spend up to twice as much for the same parts? The rockauto.com catalog is so good, so easy to navigate. Even I can navigate it. They're a family owned company. They've been in this business for a long, long time. They're really great. I could not recommend them more highly. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck write Knowles in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. All right. So Joe Biden is the nominee. Not the the nominee yet. He's the front runner. We'll see. Maybe after Super Tuesday, he'll become the nominee. But he is the front runner. He He is on a straight path to the nomination. And here he is in all his glory at a rally yesterday. Democrats, behold your leader. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the, go, you know the, you know the thing. All men and women, and you, and, and you know, you know the thing, Periclean, Lincoln-esque. Wow, what soaring rhetoric. 
He's like, he's like Reagan and Lincoln and Pericles combined. That's the best they've got. <laughs> he can't even recite one of the most famous lines in American history. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And you know, you know the thing. If Democrats nominate this guy, I never want to hear another word, not a peep, about how President Trump talks. It's not just once or twice. This is what Joe does all the time. Biden had another greatest hit on Sunday when he was wrapping up an interview with Chris Wallace on Fox News, one of the most famous journalists in the country. And he couldn't remember Chris's name. We'll see who's sleepy. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, thank you. Thanks for your time. Please come back in less than 13 years, sir. All right, Chuck. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. Uh, it's Chris, but I mean, anyway. Chris. I just did Chris. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I just did Chuck. I tell you what, man, these are back to back. Anyway. No, it's I don't okay. Know how you do it early in the morning, too. Sa safe tra you, safe travels on the campaign trail. Thank you, sir. Uh, oh, gosh. We'll see who's sleepy. Okay, I think we've seen who's sleepy. The problem here is not even that Joe Biden messed up Chris Wallace's name. I mean, he, you should know who you're talking to in an interview, or you should have the good sense just not to say the person's name. But the real trouble is what he said at the end. He goes, oh, yeah, no, Chris, man. Yeah, it's just dim back to back, and it's so early. I don't know how you guys do it. Joe Biden is saying that he does not have the energy and stamina of a TV newsman but he wants to become the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. That is not a great pitch for your own candidacy. Look, if you just say, oh, sorry, I forgot your name, Chris. Look, all you guys look the same to me. I got to go. I got to go hit the campaign trail. You make a little joke about it or something. That's fine. But to say, gosh, it's so early in the morning. How do you guys do it? Uh, I don't know, man. You're supposed to do it if you become the president. So maybe we should rethink this whole thing. My favorite part now, is that the Democrats have three real options, right? Elizabeth Warren is not going to get out of the race. We can get into why that is in just a second. And actually, by the way, if you have any questions, uh, we're doing live questions from the Daily Wire subscribers on the website and on the app. So send those questions in. We'll try to get to a few of them during the show. My favorite part about all of this is that the Democrats now have three real options. The options are the corrupt dotard, the sort of old man who can't remember the declaration of independence. He can't remember what the interviewer's name is. That's one. The doddering communist. That's two. And then the billionaire philanthropist, finance, media mogul who served three mostly successful terms as mayor of New York City, one of the world's most important cities. And the first two are winning. <laughs> they have, they actually, have, I'm not saying Mike Bloomberg is a good candidate in many ways. He's like the worst candidate possible, but just compared to Bernie and Biden, Mike Bloomberg has actually accomplished quite a lot in his life. He's actually an intelligent man, even though he gets his worldview pretty wrong. And they're going to give it to the guy. Joe Biden ran for president in 1988, had to pull out because he told very specific lies about his academic record and other things. Ran for president again 20 years later in 2008, didn't do any better. I don't think he won a single delegate either time. Now he's running again 12 years after that. Total flop, a guy who accomplished very little in the U.S. Senate. And you have Bernie Sanders, who got kicked off a commune for being too lazy. Bernie Sanders, who never had a job until he was 40 years old. Bernie Sanders, who's never affected really any serious legislation. And then you got Mike Bloomberg, who's actually made something of himself. Actually was a, he was an okay mayor of New York. He was fine. You know, he's relatively successful, got three terms, big career. And they're, the Democrats are just like, absolutely not. No way do we want that successful guy. Not a chance. Uh, Don, Donald Trump is loving this. The president is having such a great time. He loves the chaos. Here is President Trump's reaction to Pete Buttigieg's endorsement of Joe Biden. Yeah, yeah, well, he just, Buttigieg just went out and said something, and probably they'll say, hey, look, if I win, I'll put you in the administration. That's called quid pro quo, right? Quid pro quo. And they probably said, hey, listen, uh, if I win, I'll give you an endorsement, but will you take me in the administration? Now, I'm sure, like, I'm sure nothing like that has ever happened, right? But that's the way it seems to go. But no, it's rigged against Bernie. There's no question about it. <laughs> oh man, what a great, what a great response. He makes a good point, right? The point is 
What we're seeing right now is called a quid pro quo. Hey, you remember when you guys were trying to impeach me and throw me out of office for a quid pro quo that I didn't even do? Uh, they're doing a quid pro quo right now. How come, how come you only talk about my quid pro quo that I didn't even do? You don't talk about their quid pro quo. Trump's strategy, importantly, is to highlight his opponents doing the same and worse as he does, right? It's this never explain, never apologize, always attack. So he's taking every opportunity just to go after them, to needle them, to hit them. I mean, how do you attack a guy for endorsing a political candidate? Trump figured out how to, and it was a good attack. Then at the very end, he gets in there, he complete non sequitur, goes down, he goes, oh, by the way, they're going to steal it from Bernie. All right, see you guys. Because the Democrats are stealing it from Bernie has become a sort of right-wing meme. The reason it's become a meme, the reason it's become popular, the reason right-wingers are talking about it is a, because it's true, the Democrats are doing their level best to steal this nomination from Bernie, just like they did it in 2016. But B, the reason they're doing it is because it creates so much more chaos in the uh, party. And the conservatives could benefit from this, which we'll get to in uh, just a moment. First, I got to thank our friends over at NetSuite. What do companies like Ring hint to Covis, what do they all have in common aside from some of them being sponsors of this show? They all use NetSuite to accelerate their growth. Successful companies know that in order to grow faster, you must have the right tools. Whether you're doing a million, 10 million, or hundreds of millions in revenue, NetSuite by Oracle gives you the tools you need to accelerate your growth. With NetSuite, you get a full picture of your business, finance, inventory, HR, customers, and more. Very often, people can't see all those numbers. It stops you from growing. NetSuite puts it all right in front of you, gives you the visibility and control that you need to make the right decisions and grow with confidence. Schedule your free product tour right now and receive your free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits at netsuite.com slash Knowles. That's netsuite.com slash Knowles. What is it? netsuite.com slash K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Okay. So right now with Joe in the lead, President Trump is turning his attention back to Joe Biden. So the attack is shifting and a lot of people aren't catching this. The attack is shifting just from sleepy Joe. That was the original attack on Joe Biden, that Joe doesn't have any stamina. He doesn't have any energy. It's now shifting to sleepy Joe is surrounding himself with radicals. I honestly don't think he knows what office he's running for. And it doesn't matter. You know, maybe he gets in because he's a little more moderate, so maybe he gets in. But he's not going to be running it. Other people are going to. They're going to put him into a home, and other people are going to be running the country. And they're going to be super left radical crazies. They're going to be super left radical crazy. Joe's going to be in a home. He'll be watching television. Everything will be just fine. (laughs) So they're going to put Joe in a home. I love, this is a great way to get the joke across, right? Is the really funny, outrageous thing he's saying is they're going to put Joe in a home. But he just throws that line away, right? So he moves you past that. So, well, you're still laughing at, oh my gosh, did he just say he's going to put his opponent in a home? Then he moves on to, but he's going to have all these radical, crazy young people around him. And the radical, crazy young people are the ones that you've got to be afraid of. This is the evolution of the attack because I think President Trump thinks that Bernie is more beatable in a general election than Joe Biden. This is why he's propping up Bernie and he's going after Biden and Bloomberg. He, he just, I think Trump doesn't believe the Americans are going to elect a radical socialist and probably the Trump team's got a good opophile on Bernie. So he keeps saying this, right? They're stealing it from Bernie. Bernie's getting robbed. He's always kind of defending Bernie. But now he's starting to use the attacks that he would use in a general election against Bernie, against Biden, which is about the radicalism, right? He's, he's saying, yeah, even Joe Biden, you think he's kind of more moderate? Maybe, but he's a senile old man. They're going to throw him in a home. He's going to go watch TV. Then they're going to have all these radicals running the country because this is a win-win strategy, right? The strategy of going after Bernie and defending, or going after Biden and defending Bernie is not going to turn off the Bernie bros, some of whom President Trump probably wants to win over or at least demoralize enough that they don't come out and vote in the general election, right? But at the same time, it gets ready that same attack that he thinks is going to be effective in a general election. So, you know, Trump is tweeting out, he just yesterday tweets out, they're staging a coup against Bernie. 
a few days ago, he goes, Democrats are working hard to destroy the name and reputation of crazy Bernie Sanders and take the nomination away from him. I love that. They're trying to destroy the reputation of a man I'm calling crazy. Uh, next one. The Dems are working hard to take the prize nomination away from Bernie. Backroom politics, which Bernie is not very good at. His people will not let it happen again. This is real political savvy. Even the way that he talks about the home at the rally, he's talking like a stand-up comedian. He's talking like a political commentator, not as a guy in the race. A, a guy who's in the race would never admit that there's a chance that his opponent would win. Right? He would never say, let's say he wins and you're going to be okay with that. Right? He would say, no way, we're going we're gonna to win it. Now my opponent doesn't stand a chance and we're going to go beat him. But he stands back and goes, yeah, okay, let's, let's say he wins. Let's say Biden wins because he's a little more moderate or whatever. You're not going to like what happens, okay, because the, you're going to get all these radicals running it. And Biden will be in a home and he'll be watching TV and that'll be fine. He's, he's, he's got a little bit of that distance there. And he's just, he's like, you see this crazy political scene? You see what's going to happen? You guys better, you're probably going to want me. I'm not, I'm not begging for it. I'm just saying you're going to want, you're going to come begging for me if those radicals are running the show. There's a big political savvy that's going on here, which is that there are two political divides in this country. Okay, the two political divides are left-right. We already know that. That's the one we talk about all the time. The other political divide is establishment populist. Okay, and they don't, they don't exactly match up. So Trump wants to win suburban voters by presenting himself as more establishment than Bernie. That's the, that's the pitch of crazy Bernie, crazy radicalism. But he wants to mollify. He wants to pacify. He wants to kind of make nice with the Bernie voters by presenting himself as more populist than Biden. So all that tweet about, they're stealing it from Bernie. Those corrupt people are rigging it from Bernie. That's all to say, hey, Bernie bros, you and I have common cause because we're both outside the establishment. But then when he goes out and he makes the arguments about how crazy Bernie is, how he's a radical socialist, how Biden's campaign people are radicals. He's making the argument to the suburban voters, to maybe the Biden voters. He says, look, I'm more establishment than Bernie Sanders. You're going to be a lot more comfortable with me. He's making those two at the same time. Uh, very, very smart uh, strategy. I think he's doing a good job. And for people who say that I'm just saying he's doing 4D chess or something, I don't know how conscious this is. It might just be innate. But if it's innate, then it backs up something we've been saying for the long time, which is that the guy's got very good political instincts. Uh, let's take one question from the audience before we get into Super Tuesday, before we get into Chris Matthews. Here's a question from A. Michael, have moderates, Biden and Bloomberg, explicitly stated to your satisfaction that communism is immoral? Or is their only argument against Bernie that it is a good but impractical idea? No, they have not stated to my satisfaction that communism is immoral. They haven't made that argument at all. Unfortunately, a lot of right-wingers have not stated that to my satisfaction either because everybody's just making some lame bean counting economic argument. I mean, you, you remember when Barack Obama was president, they went down to Cuba and got absolutely nothing out of it, just gave Cuba everything, didn't take anything in return, didn't get any concessions from the regime. And Barack Obama, another guy who talked like a moderate but actually was a secret radical, he came out and said, look, these distinctions between capitalism and communism, they don't really mean that much for our generation. They do. They do mean a lot. They, they are totally different views of the relationship of the individual to the state of the local community to the state, of tradition and history to politics. So he said that, and, and then Barack Obama had the money line. He said, we just care about what works. That's what Mike Bloomberg's saying. He goes, socialism doesn't work. That's what Joe Biden is implying. I don't even, he's not even saying it that explicitly. Socialism doesn't work. We're going to do what works. If by Bloomberg, obviously, that's all he cares about is the efficiency of markets. If all you care about is just getting GDP up a little bit higher or just kind of making the market a little bit more efficient, then you're, you're just as bad as the hard left, as the radical left. In some ways you're worse because you're not viewing people as people and the human being is much more than just a commodity, is much more than just an economic product, is much more than just a sort of cog in a machine that can be greased or oiled or shaped 
a little bit better under different regimes. The trouble with communism is that it's, it's evil, it's wicked, it's a pest. It has no respect for human dignity. It's atheistic, it's materialistic, it discounts everything that matters to us in life. And also, it destroys the economy. That's the argument. Nobody's making it right now. Other than, I think President Trump is actually pretty good at making this argument. He makes an argument much more to the human person than any of the Democratic candidates. Okay, let's get to Super Tuesday predictions. Then we got to get to Chris Matthews, not Chris Wallace. I don't want to pull a Biden. But first, I got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. You've got to go over and buy Another Kingdom, The Nightmare Feast. This is the book of the podcast that I did with our very own Andrew Clavin. And it, you know, rose up, became one of the number one arts podcasts in the world. We got three seasons out of it. And Drew is now releasing that as a book. It's fabulous. It's about an out of work, out of luck Hollywood screenwriter who walks through a door, ends up in another world, which has got ogres and beasts and swords and all that kind of stuff. It's actually not quite as crazy as Hollywood, but still they're two different, different worlds. And it's, uh, really profound. I highly, highly recommend it. I think it's one of the great works of fiction that's been made in the last few years. Head on over and go buy that. We got Backstage Super Tuesday is coming up today and we want to hear from you. So tell us who you think will win the Democratic nomination by texting either Biden, Bernie, Bloomberg, or Warren <laughs> to 83400. And tonight during our Backstage, we will analyze the results live. So text Biden, Bernie, Bloomberg, or Warren to 83400 and we will analyze those results on Daily Wire backstage tonight. That's going to be what's going on. Bernie Sanders has got the most delegates going into Super Tuesday. So go head on over to Daily Wire. Use promo code NEVERSOCIALIST to get 25% off all Daily Wire membership plans. You know it comes with all the good stuff. So head on over. Use uh, coupon code NEVERSOCIALIST, 25% off. Dailywire.com slash subscribe. We'll be right back. We have too much to get to before Super Tuesday. I told you we're going to do our best to get through it, and we are, are on track. So Super Tuesday, this is maybe the biggest thing to look for going into it. Right now, the Buttigieg Klobuchar endorsements could have completely changed the map on, on Super Tuesday. So Super Tuesday, all these different states are going to go out and vote. Before the Club Uchar and Buttigieg endorsement, if you just look at the average of the Real Clear Politics polls, here is who was supposed to win the various states. Alabama, Biden, Arkansas, Bloomberg, California, Bernie, Colorado, Bernie, Maine, Bernie, Massachusetts, Bernie, Minnesota, Klobuchar, followed by Bernie, North Carolina, Biden, Oklahoma, Biden and Bloomberg have a tie, Tennessee, t uh, t Tennessee, uh, uh, Tennessee might be uh, Biden, I actually don't have that written. That might, that, that'll be a surprise for later tonight. Texas, Bernie, Utah, Bernie, Vermont, Bernie, Virginia, Bernie. Massive stuff. So Biden, you get what? Maybe two likely wins, one likely tie. Bernie, eight likely wins, one likely tie, and Bloomberg, one likely win. Now, what happens when you add Pete and Klobuchar's endorsements? So obviously it's not going to work out exactly like this, but if Pete and Klobuchar get exactly the number of votes that the polls were predicting, or if all of those votes do just transfer over right away to Joe Biden, all of a sudden you've got Alabama, Biden, Arkansas, Biden, California, slightly Bernie, but basically tied with Biden. Colorado, Biden, Maine, Biden, Massachusetts, Biden, Minnesota, Biden, North Carolina, Biden, Oklahoma, Biden, Tennessee, Biden, Texas, Biden, Utah, tie between Bernie and Biden, Vermont, Bernie, obviously, and Virginia, Biden. It becomes a bl Biden blowout if the Klobuchar and Pete votes actually go over to, to Joe Biden. And California is basically a tie, even California with a slight Bernie edge. Now, the big wild card here is going to be Mike Bloomberg. Mike Bloomberg is not giving up after uh, Buttigieg and Klobuchar got out. Bloomberg was asked whether he would get out too. I think you know his answer. Both uh, talked to him, Pete, earlier today and Amy just a little while ago. And I wish them all the best. I thought both of them uh, 
behave themselves is a nice way to phrase it, but they represented their country and their states very well. And I felt sorry for them, but uh, I'm in it to win it. And we are going to go out and we're going to go get them. I love this guy. I love that Mike Bloomberg has such condescension that he would say, yes, well, I felt that Buttigieg and Klobuchar, they behaved themselves. They didn't cause me too much of a problem. If they had, of course, I would have wiped them off the face of the earth. But no, no, they were good little kiddies. All right, kiddies, go away now. Uh, You know, Buttigieg and Klobuchar, they have to play nice. They have to get out early. They have to make the smart endorsement, right? They're young people. They're relatively young. They have their political careers ahead of them. They don't have $60 billion like Mike Bloomberg. Bloomberg doesn't have to worry about any of that. You know, Elizabeth Warren didn't get out. She didn't get out when Klobuchar and Buttigieg did. Why not? Because Elizabeth Warren is not quite as young as Klobuchar and Buttigieg. She's got a little less to lose in her political career. This might be the last chance that she could run for president. So she's just going to stick in it. And Bloomberg, uh, certainly this is his last chance. So Listen to this response. Listen to a response that Mike Bloomberg gave to a voter at a town hall on Fox who said, hey, I'm a gun owner. I'm a regular American, Second Amendment supporter. How come I'm not allowed to have a gun and protection, but you, Mike Bloomberg, are allowed to walk around with armed security? How do you justify pushing for more gun control when you have an armed security detail that is likely equipped with the same firearms and magazines that you seek to ban the common citizen from owning? Does your life matter more than mine or my family's or these people's? Uh, All right. Look, I probably get 40 or 50 threats every week, okay? And some of them are real. That just happens when you're the mayor of New York City or you're very wealthy and and if you're campaigning for uh, president of the United States, you get lots of threats. So I I have a security detail. I pay for it all myself. And, um, you know, they're they're all retired police officers who are very well trained in firearms. I love this guy. I love that he gives at every opportunity the worst political answer you could possibly give. He goes, are you saying, Mr. Bloomberg, that your life matter more than mine? Bloomberg more or less says, uh, yes, I am. And I'm saying that because I'm rich and famous. <laughs> it just, it just goes, look, listen, you peasant, I get threats against me because I am a famous politician and by the way, very, very wealthy. And, and look, look, I pay for my security myself because did I mention that I'm wealthy? I'm very wealthy, much, much richer than you. And that's why I need to have more rights than you have. Peasant. Uh, perfect. What a great, what great way to, uh, to connect with the voters. I get a real kick out of Mike Bloomberg's elitism, probably not going to play well in Peoria. In some ways he would be the best choice that the Democrats have because he wouldn't just completely destroy the country. In some ways he's the worst choice though, because it's pretty clear that Mike Bloomberg doesn't really like people all that much. He doesn't seem to have a great respect for people. He, he just wants to run their lives. He just wants to tell them what to do, but he doesn't, he doesn't really seem to connect with them or, or view them as human, just as cogs in a machine. I mean, he said the president is a managerial job. That tells you everything you need to know about the way he, uh, he views the world, but he's probably not going to do that well anyway. So going into tonight, it's Biden's to lose. We're going to see if South Carolina was a fluke or whether, whether it was the beginning of the end of the Democrat nomination. Now, Klobuchar and Buttigieg are not the only left-wingers to drop out in recent days. They're the only presidential candidates to drop out in recent days. But there's another major left-winger who dropped out yesterday. That would be Chris Matthews on MSNBC. Chris Matthews came on last night. It was shocking to everybody. He's had this show Hardball for 20 years now on MSNBC. He goes out and he says, hey, my first story, I'm retiring. I'm out. Here's Chris Matthews' reasoning. Let me start with my headline tonight. I'm retiring. This is the last hardball on MSNBC. And obviously, this isn't for lack of interest in politics. As you can tell, I've loved every minute of my 20 years as host of Hardball. Every morning I read the papers and I'm gung-ho to get to work. Not many people have had this privilege. I love working with my producers and the discussions we have over how to report the news. And I love having this connection with you, the good people who watch. So right off the bat, Right off the bat, you realize that Chris Matthews did not choose to retire. Chris Matthews was pushed out by MSNBC. I mean, he says it 
explicitly. He says, obviously, I'm not losing interest in politics. Obviously, I'm not losing interest in you. I love this job. I love working with people. But I've got to go. And then he explains why he's got to go. The conversation with MSNBC, I decided tonight will be my last hardball. So let me tell you why. The younger generations out there are ready to take the reins. We see them in politics, in the media, and fighting for their causes. They are improving the workplace. We're talking here about better standards than we grew up with, fair standards. A lot of it has to do with how we talk to each other. Compliments on a woman's appearance that some men, including me, might have once incorrectly thought were okay. We're never okay. Not then and certainly not today. And for making such comments in the past, I'm sorry. There it is. He got me too Chris Matthews, one of the real titans of left-wing commentary, and actually a left-winger who I always got a kick out of. I mean, he was wrong about so many things. He got that, he said he got a thrill up his leg when he saw Barack Obama. I mean, he, there were many, 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 most things he got wrong. But I always got a kick out of him. He always seemed like sort of a straight shooter in that he was saying what he believed, and he was kind of funny about it, and he was kind of ornery. So I, I, I'm sorry to see him go. He got me too and I'm really sorry to see see him go the way that he did because I, I Googled this. I said, oh, maybe Chris Matthews is some big womanizer. Maybe he's been sleeping with all the women at the show. Maybe he's pulled a Matt Lauer. Maybe he's stepping out on his wife all the time or something. No, that's not it. You, you heard him talk about it there. He said, people make comments and sometimes those comments are wrong and I shouldn't have made those comments. I said, what kind of comments did he make? He's a commentator. What kind of comments did he make? So I looked up the article that's in uh, GQ magazine uh, by Laura Bassett. This is the article that ostensibly got Chris Matthews fired. And she gives all the reasons, all the horrible things he did. Here they are. It's called, like Warren, I had my own sexist run-in with Chris Matthews. So she's objecting to something Chris Matthews did with Elizabeth Warren too. The article begins. I believe the woman, which means he's not telling the truth, said Warren who recently had to defend her own credible story of pregnancy discrimination. I'll pause right there. That first line is a lie. She doesn't have a credible story of pregnancy discrimination. Elizabeth Warren is now saying that she was fired from her first teaching job because she got pregnant. But we have her on video from years ago talking about how she didn't get that teaching job. She didn't keep the teaching job because she lacked a credential and lacked interest and wanted to stay home with her kid. Her own words. I'm not making that up. <laughs> That's what she said. Then she's lying about it now. And then this writer, Laura Bassett, writing in GQ, is lying about Warren's lies. Not a good way to start off the article if you're going to try to torpedo a guy's career. The article goes on. And why would he lie, Matthews said? Just to protect himself? Yeah, and why would she lie? Warren responded pointedly. There was no reason, I'm skipping around a little bit, but you get the point. There was no reason for him to harp on its veracity, except perhaps that he himself has made so many sexist comments over the years that he has a vested interest in Bloomberg being let off the hook and going after Warren. So she's accusing him of sexism here. It is not sexist to observe that Elizabeth Warren is a liar. Elizabeth Warren is one of the most famous, infamous, and egregious liars in the entire country. She lied for decades about her ancestry and said that she, the whitest woman in the world, was Native American. She did that at elite universities. She did that possibly taking jobs away from actual Native Americans. She then lied about the pregnancy discrimination. She then lied very recently about where her children went to school. Lies about everything. There's nothing sexist about calling a liar a liar. But you know, this woman in, in using the kind of Me Too era as a political cudgel is using sexism the way that the left has used racism for so many years, which is not to point out an actual example of bigotry, but just to silence your political opponent. Matthews has a pattern of making comments about women's appearances in demeaning ways. The number of on-air incidents is long, exhausting, and creepy, including commenting to Aaron Burnett, for example, you're a knockout. It's all right getting bad news from you while telling her to move closer to the camera. Regardless of whether you think that a MSNBC host should compliment people's appearances, it is simply a fact that what he said is not demeaning. <laughs> She's saying he, he's made demeaning comments. Well, what was the comment? The comment was, you're a knockout. That's not demeaning. 
It's a compliment. Now you could say it's not, it's wrong to compliment people in the workplace. Never give anyone a compliment. Okay, that's fine. Fair, fair enough. If we're living in this politically correct culture, fine. We can all go along with that, but you can't lie about it and say that it's demeaning. It uh, simply was not. Even this, this word, the, the word creepy, he adds the word creepy in here. Creepy is just a way to, to, you know, slander somebody without having to give any kind of example. And Chris Matt, look, I have a lot of criticisms of Chris, Chris Matthews, but I don't think he's creepy. She goes on. He, he t- she talks about an interview with Hillary Clinton. He suggested that Clinton had only had so much political success because her husband had messed around. <laughs> yup. <laughs> no one would know Hillary Clinton's name if she wasn't Mrs. Clinton. She was the first lady of Arkansas, then the first lady of the United States. And then she immediately after leaving the White House became the senator from New York, a state she had never lived in. Do you think she became the senator of New York because Hillary is just so famously good at connecting with voters? Mm, Don't think so. I think it probably had something to do with her last name. She goes on, in 2017, I wrote a personal essay about a much older married cable news host who inappropriately flirted with me in the makeup room a few times before we went live on his show, making me noticeably uncomfortable on air. I was afraid to name him at the time afraid to name him for all the flirting, the traumatic flirting, for fear of retaliation from the network. I'm not anymore. It was Chris Matthews in 2016, right before I had to go on his show and talk about sexual assault allegations against Donald Trump. Totally bogus allegations, by the way. How many years are we into the Trump presidency? They got nothing on him. Goes on. Matthews looked over at me in the makeup chair next to him, and he said, why haven't I fallen in love with you yet? Oh my gosh. Oh, Ms. Bassett, I'm so sorry this happened to you. I hope that you get millions of dollars from MSNBC to pay for the years of therapy that you will need to recover from Chris Matthews saying, why haven't I fallen in love with you yet? In a public setting, without inviting you to dinner, without inviting you to his hotel room, without inviting you to his office like Matt Lauer does, just a slightly flirtatious comment. Good grief. Then she gets to the bottom and she says that Chris Matthews needs to be fired. Having a news anchor who calls women she devil, by the way, he only did that to Hillary Clinton and it happens to be correct, and treats their assessments with infantilizing suspicion. He treated Elizabeth Warren with infantilizing suspicion because she infantilized herself by lying all the time while conducting post-debate interviews builds in a major disadvantage for female candidates. It's downright irresponsible. She brings up Matthews's employment. Uh, This is absurd. This woman should be ashamed of herself. Me Too has obviously jumped the shark. Me Too is addressing an actual problem. The actual problem is all of these mostly left-wing men in power in media and politics acting like complete degenerates and abusing women. Uh, that's a real problem. Did I mention they're mostly Democratic, mostly left-wing men who have been doing it, like Harvey Weinstein and, and Matt Lauer and all of the other ones? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got that in there. That started out to address a real problem. And now it has become a cynical tool to be wielded with impunity only when it is politically convenient. That's it. That's all it is. It's sad. It's pathetic. Because, by the way, Chris Matthews is not being fired for this Me Too thing because he made a flirtatious comment in the makeup room or something. The reason he's being fired is because he's now not left-wing enough for the Democratic Party. He's not left-wing enough for his network. And he's a very left-wing guy. But the other day he came out and came out against Bernie Sanders. Said it'd be bad if Bernie Sanders got the nomination. The other day he came out, he's made a few on-air gaffes, right? But he's made on-air gaffes throughout his whole career. He, there was this incident, it was kind of embarrassing, where he confused two black politicians and thought one was the other one. And it was very awkward, but he's been doing this kind of stuff for years. He's been talking the way he talks for years. The thing that changed is the democratic party, which is now in terms of just the delegate count is ready to nominate an open avowed socialist, an actual communist who honeymooned in the Soviet union. And Chris Matthews is from an older school. Uh, The fight that we're seeing in the democratic party nomination right now, the Biden Bernie fight is the fight that we're seeing on MSNBC. It's the fight that we're seeing in left-wing commentary. It's the fight that we're seeing in the media. And uh, that fight is only going to heat up through November. Last question before we get to it, uh, before we get to Super Tuesday later tonight. 
This is from JF. Who would be more beneficial to Biden as a VP, Klobuchar or Buttigieg? Uh, Klobuchar would. Uh, having a woman probably would be more beneficial. I think women outrank gay men on the intersectional victimhood scale. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think Buttigieg would be a great VP candidate. The only advantage he would have is he could debate Mike Pence and the left could pretend that Mike Pence is some big homophobe or something like that. But I suspect it's actually going to be someone totally different. I don't think Klobuchar or Buttigieg, these kind of fairly weak presidential candidates, I don't think that they're, they're going to be the best choice. I think you could see someone from somewhere else in politics, maybe an, another name we've heard who hasn't been around in a little while. You know, that, that's probably more likely. There's 300 million people to choose from, so they don't need to just choose from the, uh, the handful who have made it this far in the Democratic race. All right, stick around later. We will get to Super Tuesday. We have so much more to get to, but we'll have to save that for tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producers, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Assistant director, Pavel Wadowski. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Audio mixer, Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, Nika Geneva. Production assistant, Ryan Love. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. If you prefer facts over feelings, aren't offended by the brutal truth, and you can still laugh at the insanity filling our national news cycle, well, tune in to The Ben Shapiro Show. We'll get a whole lot of that and much more. See you there.